Okay, he has um, 10 newspapers where these Jews are pushing this 6 million figure between the years of 1915 and 1938. The first newspaper is The Sun of New York. New York, June the 6th, 1915. That is The Sun. It's the first page of the fifth section that I want. And there we go. The sun, it's a bit ripped. Along there, it's all come off a bit. The fifth section, this is the front page. And the article is called, Horrors Worse Than Kishinev, Charged Against Russia Today. And there's the big article. Takes up most of the page. So go in, yeah. Go. Since the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, the Jewish people have had no darker page in their history than that which the Russian government is writing today. Six million Jews, one half of the Jewish people throughout the world, are being persecuted, hounded, humiliated tortured, starved. Thousands of them have been slaughtered. Hundreds of thousands of Jews, old men, women and children, are being driven mercilessly from town to town. There it is, people. Six million Jews. One half of the Jewish people throughout the world are being persecuted, hounded, humiliated, tortured and starved. As I go along here, support here as well. Dear brethren, have mercy on the six million Jews in Russia and take our part. That's again. Six million Jews in Russia. Six million. This is in an article entitled Horrors Worse Than Kishinev Charged Against Russia Today. That's in the sun of New York Sunday June the 6th, 1915. This is 18 years before Hitler ever set foot in the government. 18 years. This is the next newspaper. This is New York Times again. It's from 1918. There it is. The New York Times. October the 18th, 1918. It's page 12 that I want. There we go. Page 12. Page 12. The New York Times. October the 18th, 1918. And the article isn't called one billion dollar fund to rebuild a Jewry. There it is. Six million souls will need help to resume normal life when war is ended. Six million souls. As I go down the article here, there's again, six million Jews need help. Six million. Six million Jews need help. There's an article called One Billion Dollar Fund to Rebuild Jewry. That is in the New York Times, October the 18th, 1918. Here's the next newspaper. This is New York Times again. The New York Times. September the 8th, 1919. It's page 6 that I want. There we go. Page 6. 
page 6. The New York Times, September the 8th, 1919. And the article is called Ukrainian Jews Aim to Stop Pogroms. Mass meeting he has that 127,000 Jews have been killed and 6 million are in peril. 6 million. As I go down the article, there it is. We come out now before the world with a determined slogan, those pogroms must stop, said the President in his annual message. It is only a question of holding these facts continually before the civilised world. We must not permit the world to slumber. This fact that the population of six million souls in Ukraine and in Poland have received notice through action and by word that they are going to be completely exterminated. You literally cannot make this up. Six million souls completely exterminated. Six million. That is an article called Ukrainian Jews Aim to Stop Pogroms in the New York Times, September the 8th, 1919. It's 13 and a half years before Hitler came to power. This is the next newspaper. This is the New York Times again. The New York Times. The date. November the 12th, 1919. It's page 7 that I want on here. There you go. Page 7 in the New York Times, November the 12th, 1919. The article is called Tell Sad Plight of Jews. Felix M. Warburg says they were the worst sufferers in the war. There it is here. The successive blows of contending armies have all but broken the back of European Jewry, he said and have reduced to tragically unbelievable poverty, starvation and disease. About six million souls, or half the Jewish population of the earth. Six million. Six million souls, or half the Jewish population of the earth. I'll go further down the article so you can read the rest of it. There is again, people, unbelievable poverty, starvation and disease. About six million souls, or half the Jewish population of the earth. In an article entitled, Tell Sad Plight of Jews. In the New York Times, November the 12th, 1919. This is the next newspaper. This is the Atlanta Constitution from 1920. February 23rd, 1920. The article is on the front page here. It's called $50,000 Raised in City to Save Suffering Jews. And it goes along the bottom. Continued on page 3, column 4. So I'll go to page 3. There we go. Constitution of Atlanta, February 23rd, 1920. There it is. $50,000 raised to save suffering Jews. Continued from first page. 
I'll go down. He called upon the Atlanta Jews to arise to the occasion and to contribute to the emergency fund in order that the lives of six millions of Jewish people may be saved. Six millions of Jewish people may be saved. I'll go further down. Rabbi Mark speaks. Rabbi Marx made an eloquent plea for generous responses to the call of the representatives of the Jewish Relief Fund. He drew a graphic picture of the starvation and suffering of the six million Jews who live in Eastern Europe and Palestine. Six million Jews. Thousands upon thousands of our people have died of starvation and pestilence, and thousands more will die, he said. There it is, people. Six million Jews. In an article entitled $50,000 Raised to Save Suffering Jews in the Constitution of Atlanta, February 23rd, 1920. This is the next newspaper. This is the New York Times. This is from 1920. There we go. The New York Times. The date, Friday, May the 7th, 1920. It's page 11 that I want. There we go. Page 11. Page 11. And the article is called The Jewish War Aid Gets $100,000 Gift. There it is. The Fund for Jewish War Sufferers in Central and Eastern Europe, where six millions face horrifying conditions of famine, disease, and death, was enriched yesterday by a contribution of $100,000 from Nathan Strauss where six millions face horrifying conditions of famine, disease and death. Six millions face horrifying conditions of famine, disease and death. I'll just go down the rest of the article if anybody wants to read it. There's an article called Jewish War Aid Gets $100,000 Gift in the New York Times, Friday, May the 7th, 1920. Here's the New York Times again. This is 1921. New York Times, Wednesday, July the 20th, 1921. It's page two that I want. There we go, page two. Page two. New York Times. July 20th, 1921. And the article is called Begs America, Save Six Million in Russia. Massacre threatens all Jews as Soviet power wanes, declares Krainin, coming here for aid. Look at that. Russia's six million Jews are facing extermination by massacre. As the famine is spreading, the counter-revolutionary movement is gaining and the Soviet's control is waning. Now this is one of the biggest articles of the lot. This is 1921, 12 years before Adolf Hitler ever set foot in the government. Look at that. Russia's 
six million Jews are facing extermination by massacre. As an article entitled Begs America Save Six Million in Russia on page two in the New York Times Wednesday, July twentieth, nineteen twenty one. This is the Gazette of Montreal. This is 1931. The Gazette, Montreal, Tuesday, December the 29th, 1931. This is over a year before Hitler came to power. The Gazette, it's page six that I want. There we go. Page six. Page 6, the Gazette, Montreal, December the 29th, 1931. And the article pretty much speaks up for itself. Six million Jews face starvation. Six million. Bad conditions in southeastern Europe reported by Rabbi Wise. Fears crisis at hand. Six million Jews in eastern Europe face starvation. And even worse during the coming winter. Six million Jews. I'll, get, I'll give you a look at the rest of the article. Mm. The article is called Six million Jews face starvation. The Gazette of Montreal, December the 29th, 1931. One and a half year before Adolf Hitler ever set foot in the government. This is the next newspaper. This is the New York Times again. There we go, New York Times. But this is dated 1936, Sunday, May the 31st, 1936. This does not say the six million Jews, but it does say Holocaust. New York Times. It's page 14 that I want. There we go. Page 14, the New York Times, May the 31st, 1936. And the article is called, Americans Appeal for Jewish Refuge. It's quite a big article. What's along here? The petition, in expressing the opinion of enlightened Christian leadership in the United States favoring a larger Jewish immigration into Palestine, stressed the intolerable sufferings of the millions of Jews in the European Holocaust. The European Holocaust in 1936, before the Second World War even started. You go up here. There it is again. Great Britain has it within her power to throw open the gates of Palestine and let in the victimized and persecuted Jews escaping from the European Holocaust. The European Holocaust in 1936, three and a half year before the Second World War ever even started. That's in an article entitled Americans Appeal for Jewish Refuge, the New York Times, May the 31st, 1936. Here's the next newspaper. This is New York Times again. New York Times. This is dated February the 23rd, 
1938. This is before the Second World War started. About a year and a half. The New York Times. It's page 23 that I want. There you go. Page 23, the New York Times, February 23rd, 1938, and the article is called, Jewish Teachers Chided by Isaacs. I'll go along the bottom. And it's, a Jewish tragedy pictured. A depressing picture of six million Jews in Central Europe deprived of protection or economical opportunities, slowly dying of starvation, all hope gone, was presented to the teachers by Jacob Tarshish. The Jewish tragedy started when Hitler came into power in 1933. There it is again, people. Six million Jews in Central Europe, slowly dying of starvation, six million, this is in 1938. Jewish teachers chided by Isaacs, New York Times, February 23rd, 1938, a year and a half before the Second World War even started. Welcome to Jewish Wisdom on JTV, the global Jewish channel. Well, the Jewish holiday Purim is just around the corner, so I wanted to share with you something that someone recently showed me, and it kind of blew my mind. So I'd be interested to show it to all of you, to see what you think, and if you're not familiar with the Purim story, let me give you a little bit of a background. It's basically about this Persian tyrant called Haman, who issued a decree to wipe out all the Jews. And through a series of seeming coincidences, Haman ends up being hung on the very gallows that he planned to put his arch nemesis on, a Jewish man called Mordechai. Now, there was a rule in place that if a law was decreed, it was impossible to change it. However, after Haman was killed, the king issued a new decree that if any Jew was attacked by a group of anti-Semites, it was within their rights to fight back. And not only was Haman hung on the gallows, but all of his ten sons, who were co-conspirators in the plot to wipe out the Jews, were also hanged on the gallows. Now, at this point, I want to look at the character of Haman in a bit more detail. Who was he? Well, why did he want to wipe out the Jews in the first place? Haman was a member of a nation called Amalek. And the Torah is very clear that if you're from Amalek, then you ain't really a fan of the Jews. Amalek believes in bl that blind chance governs the world. Amalek believes there's no such thing as right and wrong. And therefore, they are at war with Judaism and Jewish values. Now, the Torah is very clear that the cosmic battle between Amalek and Jewish values will be fought throughout history. And there have been some who have looked at another more recent anti-Semitic tyrant and considered whether he too showed signs of adhering to the Amalek principles. I'm speaking, of course, of a man called Adolf Hitler. And what's so interesting about Adolf Hitler is that he didn't just want to wipe out the Jews. It's that this mattered to him more than anything else. He was even prepared to put the war effort at risk by diverting trains delivering troops to the Eastern Front and instead taking them to pick up more Jews in Hungary and send them to their deaths. In fact, in his very last radio address, he stated clearly, quote, our battle is between the Jews and the Jews alone. The Nazi ideology was rooted in a godless vision of the world, a vision where might is right, where the strong dominate the weak, where you have survival of the fittest and the greatest threat to this vision was a vision of, mor of morality and conscience, where we should care for the weak and the vulnerable, a vision of ethical monotheism first articulated by the Jews. And this is what Hitler said. He said, it is true, we are barbarians. It is an honorable title to us. I am freeing humanity from a false vision called conscience and morality. The Jews have inflicted two wounds on mankind, circumcision on its body and conscience on its soul. The war for world domination will be fought entirely between us, the Germans and the Jews, all else is facade. So we've got two crazy tyrannical leaders in history, Haman and Hitler, both with similar ideologies and with similar aims. Now, here's where it gets interesting. 
At the end of the Purim story, the Book of Esther recalls how the Jews defended themselves against their attackers, and it notes how Haman's ten sons were all hanged on the gallows. So it says, and the Jews struck at all their enemies with the sword and with slaughter and destruction. They're fighting off these anti-Semites and did as they pleased to all, all those who hated them. And in Shushan, the capital, the Jews slew and destroyed 500 men, including, and then it lists the 10 sons of Haman. So now after Haman's 10 sons have all been hanged, the Jewish queen Esther has a conversation with the king, Ahasuerus, most likely Xerxes. It says, and I quote, that same day, the number of those killed in Shushan the capital was re reported to the king. The king said to the Queen Esther, in Shushan the capital, the Jews have slain and destroyed 500 men, including the 10 sons of Haman. What have they done in the rest of the king's providences? What is your request now? It shall be granted to you. What is your petition further? It shall be fulfilled. The king is saying to Esther, basically, listen, whatever you want, I'll give it to you. An iPad, a Ferrari, whatever it is, I'll make it happen. And what does Esther say in return? Have a look. She says, it says, Esther replied, if it pleases the king, allow the Jews of Shushan to do tomorrow as they have done today and let Haman's 10 sons be hanged on the gallows. Esther's asking the king if the Haman's 10 sons can be hanged on the gallows. Right, there's one problem with this, which is that we were just told a second ago that Haman's 10 sons were already hung. Why is Esther asking for this to happen again? What does she mean, allow the Jews to do tomorrow what they have done today? She seems to be asking for a repeat of history to take place. And if you want to get a little bit mystical, in Kabbalistic teachings, it is taught that whenever the book of Esther refers to the king, it is also a reference to God. God is never explicitly referred to in the book of Esther. So Esther is somehow, on a deeper level, asking God to repeat the hanging of Haman's ten sons. What does all this mean? Well, maybe, just maybe, this could be an answer. Fast forward to October 16th, 1946, and check out this New York Times headline. Goering ends life by prison, 10 others hanged in Nuremberg, prison for Nazi war crimes. Doomed men on gallows pray for Germany. There were basically 10 Nazis who were hung at Nuremberg. And it was death by hanging, which by the way, was a very uncommon form of capital punishment. Interesting do tomorrow as they have done today. But maybe this is just a coincidence. Now, it's interesting to note that there were actually 11 Nazis who were meant to be hanged, but one of them actually committed suicide, Hermann Goering, as it notes in the headline. It, and he committed suicide in his prison cell. And what's interesting is that Haman also had one more child, a daughter. And what happened to her? Well, she actually also committed suicide. Interesting. And by the way, Hermann Goering, the Nazi that committed suicide, was said to have actually worn women's clothing under his Nazi uniform. Hmm. But maybe it's just a coincidence. But it doesn't stop there. What's interesting about the Nuremberg trials is that they ended in June 1946, but the sentencing were repeatedly postponed due to appeals for amnesty for Nazis. Strange. Now, hold that thought for a second. It's bizarre that you're getting appeals for amnesty for senior ranking Nazis, but that's what happened. Now, let's have a look at the date on which these 10 Nazis were hung. It was on October 16th, 1946, but the Hebrew year was 5707, or in Hebrew, it's Tuf, Shin, Zion. As you can see over here, this is the Hebrew, the Hebrew year, Tuf, Shin, and Zion, 5707. That was the date in 1946, October. Now, Let's take a look at the book of Esther, where it lists the 10 sons of Haman being hanged. Someone with an astute eye will notice something peculiar about the Hebrew wording. There are three letters which appear much smaller than all the others. The first is over here, it's a tough. The second is a shin, and the third is a zion. Tough, shin, zion. Three letters much smaller than all the others within the 10 sons of Haman written in the book of Esther. Now, imagine Esther 2,000 years ago. She's dictating her book to the scribes, and she tells them, when they get to the tough, make that a little bit smaller. Same with the shin, the same with the zion. Why? Why did Esther want to do this? And it's remarkable that tough shin zion is the year that these Nazis were hung at Nuremberg. Do tomorrow as they have done today. But maybe it's 
could just be a coincidence. But what was Esther's reason? Why did she tell the scribes to make those three letters smaller? She probably just said, look, don't worry, 2,000 years from now, they'll do a show on JTV and they'll explain it all. That's probably what happened. But isn't that quite remarkable? But guess what? It doesn't stop there. For anyone familiar with the Jewish calendar, and who, if they understand how it works, they'll know that when we write the year in, the, in Hebrew, we don't actually include the millennium. We assume you know, that we, you know what millennium we're in. It would also be too difficult numerically to write which millennium we're in, as it would require so many letters in Hebrew, because the, the letters uh, correspond to a, a certain number. And therefore, Tuf Shin Zion, which we said is the year 5707, actually only equals the year 707. Tuf is 400, Shin is 300, and Zion is 7. So while it's quite impressive that the Book of Esther has the year right, it would have been a little bit more impressive if there were a hint to the millennium of the Nuremberg Trials. Or maybe there is. If it occurred in the Hebrew year 5707, then that means that it was the sixth millennium. It was the sixth time the year 707 has appeared in Jewish history. Now, what number does six correspond to in Hebrew? Well, it's a vav. Well, guess what? In the listing of the 10 sons of Haman, there also happens to be one letter, which is much bigger, not smaller, much bigger than all the others. Take a look. What is it? Yep, you guessed it, it's a vav at the very end, which corresponds to the number six. So we've got three small letters, which create the year 707, and then we've got one letter that's bigger than all the others, Vav, number six, the sixth time 707 has appeared. So, I, I mean, you can look at this and you can think whatever you want into it. Some people, most people would tend to be pretty amazed. It seems to be a pretty incredible coincidence at the very least. Now, remember what I mentioned earlier about appeals for amnesty and how crazy it is that they were accepting appeals for amnesty for Nazis. Well, the trial actually ended in June 1946, and had there never been appeals for amnesty, the Nazis would have actually been hanged in the year 5706, not 5707. And I'd be standing here today saying, look how close Esther came to the exact date. It was so close. But they ended up actually postponing the sentencing until after the Jewish New Year in October. So had there not been these appeals for amnesty, the year would have been wrong. And finally, have a look at this. This is a Newsweek article. It was written by an American reporter covering the trial and hangings. It says at the very end of the article, only Julius Streicher, one of the Nazis, went without dignity. He had to be pushed across the floor, wide-eyed and screaming, Heil Hitler! Mounting the steps, he cried out, and now I go to God. He stared at the witnesses facing the gallows and shouted, Purimfest, 1946. Hmm. You make your own mind up. How are you Purim? Before showing you very interesting table and very significant based on what Dr. Rottenberg found, Rottenberg, who, whose uh, program we are using, amazing appearances, minimal best meetings of the old story of Schneerenberg trial, the Nazis, the children of Amman, all coming together in this table. But before, very important to know how it is indicated in the Megillah, and this is what you are going to see now, really the description in the Megillah, or the hint for these indications, and then we we'll see the table, as we said, very, very significant one. So, let us see now the video, which you can see on YouTube, definitely. We took part of it.
What you are going to see now is a table which has a full description Jewish of what TV, you saw there. So this is well, exactly what you are going to see. So very important, very but interesting. Let's see kind of now. Now, what you saw now is somebody also tells the story, but we see now all this coming in very significant way, as it is a minimal of Yud in ten, the sons of Haman is in minimal, comes in one book in Genesis, and you have here best meeting of Mitafshin Zion from the year five seven zero seven which is nineteen forty six but ever they were in the grave amazingly the ten children of Amman from the year nineteen forty six Zion but ever in the grave he flew the fell to the hell yeah the fell even after being hung Amazingly, of Perdil, they were not Nitlu. They were, they were hung. Here you can see it's from the top, parallel, Nitlu. We know quite well that parallel is very, very significant. Then, what we see here also, very interesting, you see here Gilgul, they are re re reincarnation, reincarnation, and what they are? Nazi. Um, are you? Nazis, they were. Amazingly, you come here, you have here the twice the ne snake snake because Amalekite known to be snakes, yeah? And who is the heavenly minister? The Sam El. Amazingly, come here, Sam Kel. You see here, coming in quite small, this is the heavenly minister of Amalek, of these people. So, very, very interesting, very, very significant table, as we said. And let us now do it again clearly. Yud Bnei Amman, the ten children of Amman, from the year 1946, we see Zion, in the grave, Iplushola, they fell down to hell, yeah. And they were Gilgul, they were reincarna reincarnation of Nazi Sassim M, and definitely snakes, as we know quite well, that always the Medrash, the Kabbalah, shows the Amalekite together with snakes. Well, snake represents this evil force who only want to destroy, to, uh, to do everything, only to damage, to do evil, which really is a snake. So, interesting table, significant table, and I think that really is worth well, as much as one can do is to advertise it, to show it, to send it to people, because very, very significant, very much showing the truth of the Torah, the truth of Kabbalah, and everything. on me and he brought me out by the spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley it was full of bones he led me back and forth among them and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley bones that were very dry he asked me son of man can these bones live I said Sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, prophesy to these dry bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you, and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I was prophesying, 
there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together bone to bone. I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says, come breath from the four winds and breathe into this lane that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me and breath entered them. They came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. Then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the people of Israel. They say, our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off. Therefore, prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. My people, I'm going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from them. How you put my spirit in you and you will live. I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and I have done it, declares the Lord. The sight to these dry bones you shall leave. But the sight to these dry bones you shall leave. You 